Hello there, I'm Rachel with the Charlotte Mason Plenary. Thanks for joining me again for the next video in our series of Finding Your Way with Charlotte Mason's 20 Principles. Today we're talking about Principles 14 and 15, narration from a single reading, and this is how Charlotte describes them. As knowledge is not assimilated until it is reproduced, children should tell back after a single reading or hearing, or should write on some part of what they have read. A single reading is insisted on because children have a naturally great power of attention, but this force is dissipated by the rereading of passages and also by questioning, summarizing, and the like. Acting upon these and some other points in the behavior of mind, we find that the educability of children is enormously greater than has hitherto been supposed and is but little dependent on such circumstances as heredity and environment. Nor is the accuracy of this statement limited to clever children or to children of the educated classes. Thousands of children in elementary schools respond freely to this method, which is based on the behavior of mind. Okay, so let's stop and ponder these two principles. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but they are quite different from all the principles that came before these. Principles 1 through 13 are quite philosophical in nature. Things like um, children are born persons, the science of relations, um, education is an atmosphere, discipline, a life. All these things are kind of intangible ideas, philosophical ideas, and then we have to go in and figure out kind of the how-to of implementing them in our homeschools and daily lives. But these are reversed. These two principles are the how-to instead of the why. Why do you think Charlotte does that? Why do you think that out of two, out of the 20 principles, why two of them are the how-to rather than a philosophical kind of question? Um, Ponder it a little bit. I'd like to know what you think. So think about it. Maybe you could pause the video right now and put your answer in the comments below. Or you can finish watching the video and maybe ponder it some more and then come back and leave your answer in the comments below. But I'd really like to know what you think. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to reverse engineer these two principles. First we're going to talk about the how-to and then we're going to talk about the why behind it. Okay? So, first, let's take narration, because, as Charlotte says, children narrate by nature. Narrating is an art, like poetry making or painting, because it is there in every child's mind, waiting to be discovered, and is not the result of any process of disciplinary education. A creative fiat calls it forth, let him narrate, and the child narrates fluently, copiously, in ordered sequence, with fit and graphic details, with a just choice of words, without verbosity or tautology, so soon as he can speak with ease. This amazing gift with which normal children are born is allowed to lie fallow in their education. Bobby will come home with a heroic narrative of a fight he has seen between Duke and a dog in the street. It is wonderful. He has seen everything, and he tells everything with splendid vigor in the true epic vein. But so ingrained is our contempt for children that we see nothing in this but Bobby's foolish, childish way. Whereas here, if we have eyes to see and grace to build, is the ground plan of his education. Here is the ground plan of his education. Those are pretty strong words, the ground plan, the, um, like the blueprint, um, maybe even you could say foundation of his education. Why does she use such strong words about narration? Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute, but first, just in case you're new to Charlotte Mason and you're not quite sure what narration is, narration is simply the act of telling what you know. And children do this naturally. Actually, we all do this naturally. Um, if we've read a good book, we talk about it with a friend. Or if we just saw a great movie or a television show, we tell somebody about it. Or if something interesting happened to us during our day, we tell people about it. And 
sometimes I think that children in a school situation or a homeschool situation, when you ask them, okay, narrate, they don't really understand what that word means. And sometimes they get stuck on that and they freeze or they're not quite sure what you want from them. They don't know what you expect. Um, this happened with my daughter when she first started narrating. Now my son has always been a natural narrator, but my daughter didn't quite understand what I wanted. And so um, we struggled with it for quite a while. And then one day she was over at grandma's house and she came home and she started telling me about this episode, this TV episode that she watched, uh, Dora the Explorer, uh, over at Grandma's house. And she went into such great te detail telling me all the plot points of the Dora the Explorer episode. Um, when she was done telling me her whole story, I said, wow, that was a great narration. And it was like a little light bulb went off in her head. And I explained to her that narration simply is just telling a story about what happened to you, what you saw, or what you read. And so in the case of schoolwork, it's just telling back the story of what you read. And that really seemed to help. So if you have a struggling narrator, if you're new, um, take that approach because like Charlotte says we all do this very naturally and it is such an incredible boon to your education because the act of narrating is what cements the information into long-term memory. If you were to see a movie or read a book or um, have something happen to you and you did not tell somebody about it your memory of that event might not be as strong as if you actually told somebody about it and discussed it with another person. So the act of telling actually helps to cement the long-term information. Knowledge is acquired only by what we may call the act of knowing, which is both encouraged and tested by narration. Here we get the mind forces which must act continuously in education attention, assimilation, narration, retention, reproduction. But what of reason, judgment, imagination, discrimination? These take care of themselves and play as naturally and involuntarily upon the knowledge we receive with attention and fix by narration. So the knowledge is fixed by narration. That's the part you want. You want it fixed in long-term memory through the process of narration. Okay, so Charlotte uh, goes on to describe narration in detail in Volume 1 in a chapter called The Art of Narration. And she actually starts with a process that, that goes before the reading and before narration. And it's a little thing I like to call prepping the lesson. Some people call it scaffolding. I call it prepping the lesson. Um, but here's a quick little short summary of how Charlotte describes prepping the lesson. The teacher should talk a little and get the children to talk about the last lesson with a few words about what is to be read in order that the children may be animated by expectation. But she should beware of explanation and especially of forestalling the narrative. Then she may read two or three pages enough to include an episode and after that let her call upon the children to narrate. Now, if you'd like more detail about prepping the lesson, I have a whole other video dedicated just to that topic, prepping the lesson. It's called prepping the lesson. Um, so you can watch that if you want more detail. It walks you step by step through all the, I think there's like five steps uh, of prepping the lesson, and it really, really, really does help your student to narrate better. So take a look at that. Okay. What about a single reading, the part of these two principles that Charlotte talks about, a single careful reading? Well, that goes hand in hand with narration. Um, the value of narration is in the simple fact that you cannot tell what you do not know. The simplest way of dealing with a paragraph or a chapter is to require the child to narrate its contents after a single attentive reading one reading, however slow, should be made a condition. 
for we are all too apt to make sure we shall have another opportunity of finding out what tis all about. There is the weekly review if we fail to get a clear grasp of the news of the day, and if we fail a second time, there is a monthly or a quarterly review or an annual summing up. In fact, many of us let present day history pass by us with easy minds, feeling sure that in the end, we shall be compelled to see the bearings of events. This is a bad habit to get into, and we should do well to save our children by not giving them the vague expectation of second and third and tenth opportunities to do that which should have been done at first. So this single careful reading goes hand in hand with narration because you cannot know if you don't pay attention, right? So out of all the habits that Charlotte talks about, she says that the habit of attention is of supreme importance. It is impossible to overstate the importance of this habit of attention. It is, to quote words of weight, within the reach of everyone and should be made the primary object of all mental discipline. For whatever the natural gifts of the child, it is only insofar as the habit of attention is cultivated in him that he is able to make use of them. So doing a reading only once is a tool to cultivate or to build the habit of attention. There is much difference between intelligent reading, which the pupil should do in silence, and a mere parrot-like cramming up of contents. And it is not a bad test of education to be able to give the points of a description, the sequence of a series of incidents, the links in a chain of argument correctly after a single careful reading. This is a power which a barrister, a publisher, a scholar labors to acquire. And it is a power which children can acquire with great ease. So in those few quotes, I hope you have a good understanding of the why behind these two principles. But Let's stop for a moment and consider that these two things, narration and a single reading, are so, so important that Charlotte actually includes them in her 20 principles. They are foundational to the Charlotte Mason method. They are just as foundational as children are born persons. So please, please do not leave them out. Um, I have always said that don't to, I've always said not to worry about the how-to part. Like, you know, all the subjects and the how-to of each subject. That can come later. But what you need to know, first and foremost, are the principles. Because the principles are the why behind the method. And the principles are what allow you to adapt the method to your family and your children. Um, that is why I always say that you've got to know the principles. And I'm so proud of you that here you are, principles 14 and 15. You're, we're almost through. We're in the home stretch. Only four more principles to go. And you're still here and you're sticking with it. And I'm so proud of you for that. Um, now, all that being said, if you need some help with the practical application of these two principles, more than we've talked about in this video, um, I do have two other videos dedicated just to those two topics. So one of them is called Beginning Narration, and the link is right here for you. Um, and it gives a lot of excellent examples because my son helped me, and um, we go through several exercises about beginning narration. And then the other video is called The Habit of Attention and a Single Careful Reading. And that gives you some examples and some tips about how to go about um, getting, uh, acquiring that habit of attention from your child so that you can have just one single reading and get a good narration from it. Okay, so I hope this video has been helpful to you in understanding these two principles um, and getting to know the how and the why behind them. Now your homework, if you'd like to read, the, uh, the chapter in Volume 1 that describes narration, the art of narration. And I've included that for you in a free PDF download over at the Plenary website, and I'll include that link in the description. 
So you can go over there, you can download that single chapter and do the reading, and then at the end of the PDF, there are some study questions for you. So don't forget about the study questions. And then, my favorite part is talking about it with you and chatting with you over in the Facebook group. So please join us over in the Facebook group and tell me what you think about this principle, these two principles, and if you have any questions or um, concerns about how to go about applying them or if you need help, more help, I'm here over in the Facebook group. Always, always ready to answer questions. So thank you so much for hanging in there with me through all these principles. Like I said, only four more to go. You can do it. And um, I hope to chat with you soon. Thanks.